Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service at Northwest Barry United Church. It is Sunday, June the 7th, and as we film this, of course, on Thursday, it's a beautiful spring day. Hopefully, it's a beautiful spring day as you watch it there on Sunday. Now, this weekend was scheduled to be a very special weekend at our church. It was our Spring Melodies concert. For those of you who don't uh, attend Northwest, Spring Melodies is our annual variety show in which we showcase uh, our musical talent uh, and other kind of talents uh, here at our church. And unfortunately, for the first time ever in the history of our church, we're not able to host it. I know a lot of people, including myself, are really missing it this year. So Amanda, our music director, has put together a slideshow celebrating some of the shows from the past. So we're going to watch it now for a moment, and I know for a lot of you this will bring back some really good memories. I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you, Amanda, for putting that together. And thanks for all those who've taken part over the years. Uh, Spring Melodies 2021 is going to be amazing. I can guarantee it. As always, we'd like to begin with uh, celebrations and announcements. There are two celebrations to share today. Firstly, I would like to wish Ed and Nancy Sutton a very happy 60th wedding anniversary. And that's uh, an amazing achievement. So all the best to uh, Ed and Nancy. I'd also like to wish Eric Johnson a very happy birthday, who is celebrating this week, or Chef Eric, as many of us know from uh, Sparrow Lake Camp. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, the month of June is Pride Month. And uh, here in Barry, or Northwest Barrie United Church, uh, we've always had a presence in the local Pride Parade and the local Pride Festival, which of course we're not able to do this year. But I do want to acknowledge the importance of this month, particularly after what we've seen going on in the United States the past couple of weeks, how important it is for all of us to stand in solidarity with those who face discrimination and injustice. I'm very proud that Northwest Barrie United Church is an affirming congregation and stands with all of our LGBTQ brothers and sisters in Barrie and around the world in promoting a better, more just world where all can live free from discrimination. We have one announcement, and it's the one we've had the last couple of weeks. We're going to go back out into the garden uh, where Daniel and Terry are and get an update on our campaign, Wake Up the Garden. Well, it's another beautiful day here in the garden and Terry is again at work adding more plants to keep up with the donations that you keep sending in for our Wake Up the Garden campaign. And what a wonderful response it has been. We are barely into June and we have raised almost $6,000 towards our $10,000 goal. So we can keep Terry working for another couple of weeks as we get towards our goal of 10,000. Again, just as a reminder, at the end of the broadcast, you will see different ways that you can donate to the church by email, by mailing in a check, or by donating through the website online. Please just remember to add the note, wake up the garden, and help us get to our goal of $10,000. Thank you again. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Terry, and thank you to everybody who is donating uh, towards the campaign. It's great to see how well we're doing. Listen now for the words of our call to worship. Come, friends, near and far, in every corner of our city, every corner of our nation, every corner of our world, and gather in for worship. Come with an open mind and an open heart, ready to receive the gift of God's grace found in music and message. And may the gift of peace and the promise of hope be yours to take with you as we begin a new week. Our hymn today is Give to Us Laughter. Again, you'll see it on your screen. Uh, please feel welcome to sing along at home. Give to us laughter, O source of our life. Stars and with bright northern light. 
Please join me now in our prayer of approach and let us pray. God, center us in this space of worship. Draw us entirely here. Focus our minds. Help us to drop our burdens and open us to the presence of your spirit. As we share music, message, laughter, and joy, may we know again that we are not alone. And may we find in the harmony of worship peace for our spirits and courage for our journey. Amen. Our special music today is a piece that was performed by our choir at uh, Spring Melodies and also at our worship service. And they're going to recreate uh, that piece today in their own unique way. So I know you're going to uh, enjoy this. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea, whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go, in the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the beast in my troubled sea, whoa. You are the beast in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. This morning I'm continuing with the series I'm doing called A New Normal and looking at some Bible characters who had to face great times of change in their life. So today we're going to look at Nehemiah and I'd like to read a passage from the book in the Bible that is named after him. And this is Nehemiah chapter 2 uh, verse 11. As you'll hear in the message, Nehemiah was the one who led the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem 
after they had been destroyed. And so this is a passage in which he begins that process. So I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. I got up during the night. I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the animal I rode. I went out by night to the valley gate, past the dragon spring, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. When I returned, I said to the leaders, you see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burnt and its walls reduced to rubble? Come, let us rebuild the walls of this city so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that God had directed me, but they mocked and ridiculed me, saying, you cannot do this. So I alone began the work, and they still mocked me and asked me to come down from the wall, but I told them, I cannot come down, for I am doing something too important here. Soon others joined me, and in 52 days, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. And when all the nations heard of this, they were afraid, for they knew that this had been accomplished with the help of our God. Amen. So today we get to the second message again in this series called A New Normal. The second biblical character who had to respond to and adapt to a new reality. And before we get to today's topic, I'd like to just take a moment to recap what I spoke about last week. For those who tuned in, the topic was Noah's Ark. And I spoke about the three things that Noah had to do to find his place in his new normal when the flood had subsided and the ark had come to rest on the earth. The three A's. Firstly, he had to adjust his thinking. Secondly, he had to adapt his actions. And thirdly, he had to accept his fate. So today I want to go back into the Old Testament and introduce you to a guy named Nehemiah. And I say introduce, <clears throat> excuse me, because while most people know who Noah was, Nehemiah is not quite so well known. But he does have something to teach us about getting through trying times, but in a very different way from Noah. While Noah's new normal came out of a natural disaster, in his case a flood, Nehemiah's new normal was the result of human action, specifically a war. So let me set the stage for the story. In 586 BC, there was a particularly nasty individual intent on world domination. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the Babylonian Empire, and the army he commanded was fearsome to say the least, the strongest, most powerful fighting force on the planet. Standing in his way of world domination was, among others, the sleepy town of Jerusalem, home to the Hebrew people. Jerusalem did not have a large army to protect itself, but what it had was a very impressive wall that surrounded it in its entirety. The wall was enough to deter most tin pot dictators from thinking that the city would make a good prize, but for the Babylonians, it was merely a small hurdle to overcome. Nebuchadnezzar declared war on Jerusalem and within a short time period was able to overwhelm the city. He didn't just want to occupy it, he wanted to flatten it. That meant not only punching a hole in the wall, but decimating the walls as he went. And then seemingly for the sport of it, he went on to destroy the most iconic and important symbol in Jerusalem. And that was the temple, the home for the Jewish people of their community life and their life of faith. After the Babylonians had scurried away like playground bullies off to torment their next victim, the people of Jerusalem had to deal with their new normal. Their city was in ruins. The walls that protected them were flattened. Well, they rallied together, and within a relatively short time, they were able to rebuild much of the city, including the temple. The walls, however, were a very different story. 
The leader of the city had good intentions. He hired workers to rebuild the walls, but they quickly became overwhelmed with the task and declared it was too difficult. He came back down and the project was abandoned. And it was abandoned for some 140 years. For 140 years, the walls lay in ruins. For 140 years, the people of Jerusalem were not protected. Well, cue Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a prophet in the Hebrew or Jewish faith. He lived outside of Jerusalem, but he had a dream or a prophecy in which he believed he was supposed to go to this holy city, which he did. And there he found a city still partially in ruins, populated by those who'd pretty much given up any hope that life was going to get better. They were as broken as the walls around them. Upon entering the city, the Bible says he fell to his knees and he cried to God. Not cried out to God, literally cried, wept over this once beautiful city and its people that now seemed in such poor shape. After crying to God, he asked God to intercede, to fix the problem. And essentially God said, sure, I will, through you. I want you to lead the rebuilding of the walls. I want you to restore hope to this once mighty place. I want you to be the positive voice of positive change. Now, there's no evidence to suggest that, that Nehemiah was a builder or a carpenter or that he'd ever been inside a Home Depot. But what he had was a passion to fix this problem. What he had was a calling from God to be the hands and voice and presence of hope. So what did he do? He did what probably most of us would do, get help. Off he went to search for people who were builders or carpenters or could simply help build the walls. What did he find? He found a different kind of wall. He found a wall of apathy, of anxiety, and of learned helplessness. It's pointless, the people said. If we haven't got these things built in 140 years, we're not going to get them built now. So let me ask you a question. Would that have been enough to convince you to abandon this project? If you were Nehemiah, would you have said, fine, suit yourself. I don't even live here. And then would you, would you have gone off and gone home? I think for many of us, the answer might be yes. Nothing pops our bubble more than the negativity of other people. Nothing steals our initiative that hearing people say it can't be done. <clears throat> How quickly the naysayers can convince us to abandon even what we know is right. But Nehemiah was a different kind of guy. The negativity of others didn't pop his balloon. In fact, it seemed to inflate his sense of purpose and mission. Basically, he said to himself, if it's going to be, it's up to me. Picking up a hammer and grabbing a ladder, he climbed on top of the ruined walls and he got to work. And what did the people do? They mocked him. Look at that crazy guy up there. Does he think he can fix all these walls by himself? Nehemiah, they said, come down. Come down from that wall. Nehemiah stopped his work, put down his hammer, wiped his brow, looked down at the people, and he said to them, I cannot come down. I am doing something too important up here. Those words, and I'm assuming the resolve and passion behind them by which they were spoken, were like a match igniting a flame. They seemed to lift the people from their apathy, awaken them from their collective slumber. I cannot come down. I am doing something too important here. Suddenly ladders started to appear everywhere as people began to join Nehemiah in his quest to fix what was broken. Something had changed in the air. Driven upward by a new sense of purpose, 
a renewed belief in themselves. They got to work on rebuilding the walls, brick by brick, and by doing so, rebuilding their hope. And the walls, in 52 days, were completely rebuilt. It's a great story. <clears throat> it's a powerful story of what one person can accomplish when they are fueled by passion and purpose and positive thinking. What one person accomplish, can accomplish when they refuse to be victimized by the hopelessness or the helplessness of others. The story of Nehemiah has always inspired me. I truly believe he's one of the great unsung heroes of the Bible. So as we did with Noah, let's now take this story out of the scriptures and lay it over this situation that we find ourselves in with our own new normal. What does it have to teach us? What does it have to inspire in us and show us? We don't live in a city surrounded by walls. We're not facing imminent attack from a neighboring army. At least, I don't think we are. But we are facing an enemy. And we have been for a while. And what a powerful symbol for the kind of destruction that an enemy can do, even a microscopic one, when it finds, our way, it finds its way above or through our walls. This tiny virus may not have the armor or the might of the Babylonian army, but it had the same purpose, to destroy that which is in its path. And we've seen the destructive force, firstly in people who've become ill and people who've lost loved ones. We've seen its destructive force economically as the world teeters on the brink of global recession. We've also seen it in terms of our inward lives. Like the temple in the story that was exposed and then destroyed, this virus has exposed some of the most fragile and sacred places within ourselves. As we may have felt a fear and a worry that we may never have experienced before and we feel vulnerable. We have been under attack. And maybe we are feeling a little like those ancient citizens of Jerusalem. A little down, a little beaten up, a little tired, a little perplexed, a little worried, a little like just kind of giving up. The walls are down, we are exposed, and we wonder What's coming next? And then this week, the next showed up. Just when we thought that life couldn't get any more anxious, a Minneapolis police officer single-handedly ignited a country and a world. Americans and others took to their streets in rage-driven protests after the gut-wrenching death of George Floyd, the unarmed black man choked by a white police officer. Before long, peaceful demonstrations gave way to a far more menacing beast. As stores were set on fire, police grappled with protesters, and the streets of America, while only days before had emptied out because of the virus, suddenly filled in with angry mobs seeking justice. And we have another reason to nominate 2020 as the most destabilizing year of our lifetime. Can I just say, oh my goodness me, what a time this has been, friends. I was thinking this week about the books that are going to be written and the songs that are going to be sung and the movies that are going to be made to capture this year that's been unlike any that we, most of us, have seen in our lifetime. And we are still only in June. The walls are broken, and we may feel as vulnerable as those ancients long ago. So I guess one of my questions this morning, with all of this going on, is, where are the Nehemiahs? Where are those who in difficult times, inspire the best in us? Where are those who simply by their example encourage us 
to be more and to do more, or even just to calm us down. You know, when I think of the racially charged protest in the United States, I can't help but think back 60 years ago when America found itself in a similar situation, striving to bring justice to those who were on the sidelines. But a voice heard above all the others back then was the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. Now there is an example of a Nehemiah. He fought for justice passionately, relentlessly, and fearlessly. But he did it through the lens of a remarkable faith in which he believed that justice, real lasting justice, cannot come from violence and hatred, but from a place of compassion, understanding, love for one another, love for neighbor. His nonviolent approach to change in the ilk of others like Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or Jesus himself was exactly the voice that needed to be heard above the din and the clamor of chaos. You know, one of his most famous quotes was this, hate does not drive out hate, but only love can do that. He got results not by stoking the fires of fear, but by fueling a passion for positive change. How desperately we need those measured and hopeful voices of people like Martin Luther King Jr. right now. I cannot come down from here. I'm doing something too important. One thing this coronavirus has taught us is that there is a real need for impassioned and visionary leadership in our world and even in our communities. This virus has harmed us, but it's also taught us. It has taught us that we are not demigods stalking the earth, able to do whatever we wish to do, impervious to forces beyond our control. But we are as vulnerable and fragile as every other form of life. And we have, therefore, a real obligation to take care of the world and to take care of one another. Getting through this new normal is going to require all of us to harness the strength of our convictions, to be leaders, even in our homes, our circles of influences, not voicing fear, but lifting up faith, not succumbing to darkness, but holding up light, not shrinking from the naysayers, but inspiring and encouraging the hopeful. If you take nothing more from the story of Nehemiah, Will you please take from it a reminder of the power of even one voice, one action, one act of courage and compassion that can set off a chain of events that can rebuild and restore. On Wednesday, on my FaceTime chat that I do each week, I shared a poem called The Power of Love. And I'd like to just share it again. I mean, sorry, The Power of One. Let me share it again. One song can spark a moment. One flower can wake a dream. One tree can start a forest. One bird can herald spring. One smile begins a friendship. One handshake lifts a soul. One star can guide a ship at sea. One word can frame a goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. One laugh can conquer gloom. One step must start each journey. One word must start each prayer. One hope will raise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make a difference. You see, it's up to you. And isn't that true? That lesson of Nehemiah is that there is power in even one voice and one action. We think we can't do anything to bring change. 
we can often do more than we think we can. Mother Teresa once said that we do extraordinary things when we do ordinary things with extraordinary love. Let me tell you a story. It's a true story of the power of one. I came across this local story from Barry that was written by actually a member of Northwest who is a journalist here in town. The story was written by a, uh, about a woman named Kunal Patel. She owns a local, and I hope I say this right, Sharon, if I don't say it right, let me know. Is it a Caseta franchise? It's a restaurant. Sharon's shaking her head. It's a sub place, and uh, I'm more of a subway guy, so I, I don't, I've never actually eaten there, but I believe it's called Caseta. Anyway, her story really touched me. On March 15th, she was forced to close her restaurant as the city shut down, as the world shut down. She was heading into the busiest season at her place as her place on one of the main thoroughfares in Barrie that heads out of town towards cottage country and people often stop there to get lunch on their way. She doesn't have a drive through window, so she couldn't even rely on business that way. How easy it would have been for Canal to have given up. The walls are broken, walk away. But Canal had grown up in India, and when she was young, her town was visited by a devastating flood. But what she remembered from that time was that everyone pitched in to help each other so that they could get through the crisis together. And she remembered something her dad had said to her. He said this, where you stand in a crisis can redefine you. Let me say that again. Where you stand in a crisis can redefine you. So she thought to herself, how can I stand in this crisis? How can I help my neighbors? Next door to her was a Scotiabank. She figured this was a stressful time for anybody working long hours in a bank. So she put together free meals for all the staff and took it over to them. Next, she heard of a cleaning company that was offering free sanitization for offices. Their employees often worked overnight. So Canal made them free meals to help them through their long shifts. And then she turned to the big fish in the sea, the Royal Victoria Hospital, where so many of our heroes are hard at work. And she started providing free burritos to people on the staff. As she said, when you have less, you simply give more of what you have. And doing so fills me with gratitude. Her story is remarkable, not in its complexity, but in its simplicity. We do extraordinary things when we do ordinary things with extraordinary love. Instead of giving into loss and frustration and fear, she found a way to rise above it. Faced with brokenness, she chose the way of wholeness. She chose the way of Nehemiah. And I loved how she framed it all in that single, simple phrase, where you stand in a crisis can redefine you. Where you stand in this crisis can redefine you as well. I guess the message this morning really is a very simple one. COVID-19, acts of injustice, terror on the streets, it can all seem very overwhelming. The walls of what we have taken for granted seem shattered these days, leaving us all feeling as vulnerable and fragile as that temple in the center of Jerusalem. How easy it can be to give up and to give in. So take heed of the story of Nehemiah, who wouldn't listen to naysayers, who wouldn't listen to the doubters, who wouldn't listen to the defeated or the apathetic, but he listened to the voice of God who said, you can do this and I will be with you and they will follow. Don't give up, folks. Keep finding ways to be the voice of hope that rises above it all. 
Keep finding ways to be the hands of change that fix and heal. Keep finding ways to be the heartbeat of love in your home, in your neighborhood, among your family. Pick up your hammer and get to work, even if you work alone. Because out of brokenness can come beauty again. And from the rubble of past mistakes can arise strength and hope for tomorrow. And sometimes it just takes one voice, one light, one act. I cannot come down, for I am doing something too important here. Amen. I'd like to end the service as we always do with uh, sharing a prayer. And at the end of the prayer, I'm going to offer the Lord's Prayer, and I, I hope you'll say it along with me. And again, let us come together and let us pray. God, we give you thanks that in times of uncertainty, we can have moments of worship that truly provide for us a place of rest to rest our spirits. We thank you for the story today of Nehemiah. And we pray that it will inspire us to consider ways that we can do ordinary things with extraordinary love and so add to the light in this world and diminish the darkness of division and fear. We do pray for peace in our hearts. We also pray for peace in our world. We know that for peace to come to our world, it must find its way first through justice. Out of the tragedy of loss and confusion that we've seen this week, may we feel newly inspired to do the work of our faith in creating a world where all are welcome at the table, where all have a voice, where all have a place. Continuing in prayer now, we think of who we're praying for today or what we're praying for today. And so in this silent, sacred moment, we offer the prayers that are in our hearts. God, hear our prayers. As we journey now into a new week, May we go in faith, may we go in peace, and when and where we can, may we be your hands and feet of goodness and love. Hear us now as we continue to pray in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I, I hope you enjoyed the service and I, I hope you enjoy the week that is to come. As always, I'd like to uh, close with the words of a blessing. And these words today were written by Reverend Robin Wardlaw, who is the minister at Glen Rhodes United Church in Toronto. I'd like to share his closing words of hope and inspiration. God's touch is gentle, like a summer breeze. God's voice thunders like an autumn hurricane. God's love aches for you and for all the world like a mother aches for her child's well-being. Go forth with God's touch on your shoulders, God's voice echoing ahead of you, and God's love to keep you strong. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Great week. I'll see you again next week.